All right, hey team, we're here with Jared Campion, uh, entrepreneur, jokester, uh, contrarian. What would you say? Handsome. Like, how would you? <laughs> That's that. Handsome. Yeah. You did shave your beard a little bit. It's I did. It's looking a little more fresh. It's a bit fresh cut. Yep. I yeah. I like it. It's getting a bit raggedy. Yeah. So we have to go. Well, let's talk about your vocation. We're in the middle of the series, vocation, and we're going to interview some of the crew who are doing interesting things. You are doing a couple of interesting things, obviously working with us, doing outreach, but way before that, we were in Japan together and you were doing startup culture. We actually met, I believe, maybe in the onsen and uh, <laughs> yep. back in those early days yep. uh, in Japan pioneering. But you started a company. Yep. Do you want to tell us about uh, what is starting a company like in Tokyo uh, as a, I guess, a foreigner? Yeah. So I went to Japan to work with basically – we're there for the church to be involved in getting the church going. And then I felt, you know, my call was a little bit different. I like still obviously going to church and being part of a church, but really to go into like, you know, the corporate world. And um, we, had ch we had a child, so I had to make more income for my family, like ultimately. When we when uh, we made a decision to stay in Japan, my wife made more money than me because she's smarter and better than me in most ways, but not all of them. I'll get to that later, and uh, <laughs> I won't get to it. But anyway, she she made most of her money, so I had to like make more income. So I went into the corporate world, and then was always interested in building something. So was tinkering a lot with different ideas, different consulting gigs and started a couple of companies which failed and then oh it's still going but i exited not without making any money from and then dream drive was for me the business i started when i was thinking what is the one thing i really want to do like if i could do anything what would i do like what's a business i'd really want to build um so yeah so i just went about starting it and being in tokyo is definitely a lot of language barriers and so forth. So I actually started that business in Tokyo with a focus on customers coming from overseas. Yeah. So, so is there a bit of a startup culture in Tokyo? There is. Well, there's a big desire to be like a startup ecosystem. So I went to a lot of networking events. I met a lot of friends who are, who are running, uh, still are friends of guys running some of the big name startups in Japan. Um, I mean, these companies in Japan have a hard time getting out of Japan. Um, but yeah, there is a bit of an ecosystem. There's a lot of investment, um, but they're really looking what Japan, the startups that do well in Japan are startups that kind of mimic something that's happening in America, like let's say Airbnb or Uber. Uh, maybe it was not the best example, but some companies like that. And then they do it in Japan, in Japanese before the big players come over is like a pretty classic business that they want to invest in. Yeah. Um, and then they maybe try and exit by selling it to that company. But a lot of the time it becomes very different. Japan's a very different market. So the product comes very different and it kind of works only in Japan. And then they have a hard time getting out of Japan. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Right. So, okay, Dream Drive. So you make, is that like sleeping pills or? Yeah. Some kind <laughs> of, um... It's a golf, uh, no, no. So yeah, Dream Drive is a camper van business. So I grew up with camper vans in England and my, I saw my parents go from, we were relatively poor, or my dad was very stingy. Uh, not, still not sure which one, but uh, growing up. And then he had a business that started to go quite well. He retired quite young. And what he brought with him once he had money was like a vintage camper van. I always wanted him to get a brand new car. And when he showed up home with that like 1960s camper, like Volkswagen, I was kind of like, oh yeah, that's actually really cool. I, I like that, and um, I, I just things. always, yeah, I was always drawing it. I think you grew up around a bit of yeah. a Volkswagen camper with yeah. Josh, yeah, your best mates. So yeah, so it always breaks all the time, you know. <laughs> so it always oh, yeah. takes Forever. takes takes a long, a lot longer to get somewhere. Um, but yeah, I grew up with that. I love traveling around. The sense of freedom, just rock up, and you've got like you can go anywhere. And um, yeah, and then. We moved to my family moved to Australia when I was sixteen, so I only had about three years 
of that culture in England. And then when we got here, I was we we're going to the beach, off roading, sleeping in swags. Couldn't afford a camper van when I was young. Swag is like a um oh, it's like a canvas. There's a match a very thin mattress. Yeah. With a waterproof canvas. It's what like drovers and everything use when they're out on the uh, on the road. Yeah. Sheep. It's a futon it's of Australia, isn't it? Yeah. Like you yeah. have one under the you have one on the back. So for it's a roll out mattress for a real thin. Yeah. Do you have one? I grew up with them. Awesome. Yeah, sleep in them all the time. Yeah. Yeah, they're great. So we'd have a swag and a four by four like Subaru. And we'd go to Double Island Point. So that was like our my experience here. So in fast track to in Japan for about for twenty I guess I was in Japan for about uh, ten years, maybe around ten years. Um then it is like I was starting to think about like I was involved in some tech startup and I was like, oh, it's not really that passionate about it that I don't have a I'm not that excited about HR tech you know <laughs> so I started to think about wouldn't Australia Japan be great if people were to come over here and drive around Japan get that sense of freedom and Japan's an amazing place to travel there's so many amazing small towns so I kind of felt like geez if you just had your bedroom in the back of a vehicle you could just you'd look Japan would be amazing you got the onsen and Bathhouses, and I really wanted to bring that spirit of adventure, of travel to Japan, um, and that was the initial kind of goal. In, in and that's what Dream Drive was. It was a camper van rental, but we made our own vehicles, which have our own look and feel. Like I wanted it to not look like you're in sleeping in a car. Yeah, we wanted it to be like more of a home on wheels. So we use lots of woods and natural materials, and right. kind of create a nice atmosphere. Yeah, they're amazing. So back up and tell us, like, how do you get from zero to one? You got this idea, and then you pull the trigger on you make your first sale. That's often the hardest part yeah. of a startup. Right. So zero to one is really difficult. Yeah. But so what was how long did that process take? Yeah. So I was a bit. I don't know if you know the story, but it's not. It's a bit, a bit of a cheeky story. What I did is I made a fake website called Dream Drive. As you did. Yep. And I got a photo of Mount Fuji. And then I got a photo of like an Instagram van, which kind of looked a bit like what I wanted to do, but I kind of had to maybe splice a couple of images together. And then I got someone on Fiverr in India just to make it look like that vehicle's looking at Mount Fuji. And then I made a rental website pricing and everything like that. So what you did is called marketing. It's called marketing, but there wasn't actually, if you clicked a book it, there's nothing. There's no product, but it is to see if there's any interest. Yeah, basically. basically I didn't want to like invest all this money and start this thing if no one's interested. I yeah, want to make sure totally. there's someone that's actually going to book this, um, you know. And so, yeah, so we made a website. I would put some ads up on Facebook, spend a little bit of money and just kind of tested to see is this gonna have legs or not. And it got really good reaction from that, enough for me to go, okay. And I also talked to a lot of my friends about it. Like loads of people, I don't ever talk to you about it at the time, but I just talked to a lot of people about, um, hey, I've got this idea, what do you think? You know, like, I think this is this could be could be something. And I fair, you did have a lot of ideas. I did have a lot of ideas, but, and I like to talk but about ideas. I said, Jared, one day, <laughs> one of his ideas is gonna be big time. Or be in jail. That was something. What was the part of that? No, no, sure. So, but I went. I did uh, talk to lots of my friends about it, hustle them about it, and kind of like I'm trying to get them to talk me out of it a little bit, like a bit of debate, like what do you reckon of this? And they hit me back, and it helps me. You know, it helps you really clarify is this smart or not. And I kind of felt like you know maybe this is good. So you have to look at the rental licenses and all those things. But we did the test site, and that was enough for me to go think. I'm gonna invest some money and actually build a vehicle now. So I got my family car converted <laughs> with a very understanding wife, got with her permission or without her permission, <laughs> convert the vehicle family car into like kind of like a vehicle with a bed in the back and 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 that. And then we actually did a proper booking and made it real. Did a cool video, paid my mate to help me make a logo and stuff like that, Tyson. And then yeah, we basically had a MVP like minimal viable product of like you pay for it, you get that and it's kind of okay. And again, it was good response. Like people were booking it, people were loving the trips. 
and we really felt okay it was we we're onto something so you here. started a rental van business with one van with my own van with your own van. with my family car that's so smart it was pretty cheap and then based on the results of that i managed to get bmw mini to give me a vehicle with a rooftop tent and put that in the fleet and then i started you know i've been talking about it for a while and some of the guys were like you know when was i gave you one of my vehicles would you put in the fleet so i started to get a bit of a a bit of a fleet together and then i went on i did raise a little bit of money from the, you know my old boss dom um some of the board men but it was like brian for who were on the board which i was managing some guys had kind of worked with me in the past who were like you know yeah why not would like to see this what happens <laughs> if it's if this uh takes off it's a bit of a different business in japan and then we raised a bit um and then we got like a bit of a you know i needed more space like doors kept opening basically my i think my philosophy has always been walk through doors until they close and we needed more space to build the next vehicle this guy gave me a really amazing building and just let me have a little bit of it but it's part of a much larger building which later became our factory when you say he gave it to you like very cheap rent okay yeah <laughs> you didn't just didn't sign over the lease no <laughs> but it made it so affordable like we're basically paying for two parking spaces and it came with like a workshop and a upstairs office and then there's like we've got four buildings there now like much larger ones but we kept that one um we still it's our paint room upstairs and downstairs it's a bit of storage um but yeah it just gave it just allowed us to grow bit by bit by bit like next let next little bite and yeah and things are really starting to take off around that so point what year was that That'd be like 2018, 2019, just okay. before the old pandemic. Okay. So So you were you were doing well, you were doing the rental business. Yeah. How many vans did you have at that time? At, um at the height of that? We got up to like twenty something. Yeah, right. Maybe just twenty, or maybe it was like around twenty. Okay. Um I think in my mind it's twenty one, but I'd have to check. But yeah, so we got around what we did was the model we had, because I was doing it very without too much investment. Like I wasn't when I went to I went I went and hit up all the investors. We did get some good investment, but they weren't interested in giving us loads of money just to turn into vehicles. So I wasn't able to get like a lot of money. Um, so what the model we had, which is like basically the only door we could walk through, was people would give us, I people would give us money, would buy a used van would do a fit out for them and then we'd give them a return a profit share on the actual vehicle how much you get rents would give them a kickback of it which worked really well and when we did come to actually sell those vehicles because we did we'll get to it but we did shut down the rental business we all s sold a vehicle i think all of them or maybe all but one or two made more money on the vehicle from what they paid in originally and they took like a rental return Right. from it um so it yeah ended up being a good investment for them it was for those people for me it was uh, yeah we were obviously if you know your dates corona hit and yeah. we, were, we were like a tourism business oh, so you get to 2020 yeah um the world shuts down in february yeah well, what are you thinking then well i remember it happening over new year's like we were getting we just before that happened we just took investment from like a vc um the vc came in we're really starting to like scale up. Okay, let's go. Let's get this thing going. Like tourism in Japan was taking off. Um, and I remember as soon as they invested, the bookings died. Yeah. Wow. Like this before this before the pandemic. We're like, what's going on? <laughs> like yeah. it's December. Uh, as soon as December finished, January took over, bookings came flooding in. Like all throughout the year was getting booked. And we're like, wow, we've done it. Like this is going to be an amazing business. And that's when Princess Cruise, you know, I don't remember that's that true. cruise ship. Princess Cruise in, in Kawasaki. Yokohama, yeah. Which is right next to you. Kawasaki, yeah, right next. We could see it driving. You see it when you drive wow. over the bridge. So that was there, uh, wow. quarantined. Um, and people were like, oh, what's going on here? And it's big, that was a big news at the time. And then, sure enough, you know, Japan just completely shut down the borders and we had to start refunding all of our customers. And Ouch. yeah, we had no business model apart from tourism um so you know we thought at first we thought oh this is just gonna be like a few few yeah, months a few exactly. weeks few months what no big deal yeah but obviously that dragged on i think japan was closed for three years 
More? Less? I don't know. No, it wasn't that long. It felt like it. At least two, <laughs> no, at least two it years. Did. It was close to at least two years. It came back after the Olympics, but like a fair bit after. It might be, it might be around two years, but whatever it was, we yeah, couldn't I mean, survive. You, you, out, but it, but yeah. it wasn't really open for tourism. No. Yeah. So it was an interesting time in Japan. Like you go to like think places like Kyoto and oh, like yeah. places that are absolutely packed with foreigners. And then you go, because yeah. like, I used to do photo shoots and stuff. You go in there and there's no one there. Oh, it's like, amazing. It's actually amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> to be there at that time. It was like, it was like. It was amazing days. unless you're in tourism business. Exactly. And it's like, <laughs> terrible. So yeah, so that shut down. We refunded all of our customers. But then we were like really in big trouble. So okay. I, I kind of a VC just wrote us off at that point thinking, okay, that's gone. So you thought that nah, the business is done. Well, the diff- the thing is I, man- I had a really hard t- time hiring good stuff before the pandemic. Once the pandemic hit, a lot of Japanese craftsmen lost their jobs. Guys who hadn't lost it, like you couldn't get these guys, but like f- excellent furniture shops let, let go of guys. Um, a lot of things were on hold. So we were actually getting amazing talent hire coming to our team so we kept hiring we hired them like great so we we got this really influx of amazing talent thinking about like kazu tomo like you're here and some of these guys are still there um and then so our product became really good like too good yeah right so So you raised money that kind of like carried you through we had enough yeah we had enough to make a few moves we i basically had enough money to make one 3d design of like a product we could sell. So shift from rentals, we had a factory, we had some images, some cool images of like tourism around Japan. We basically made a pivot, you'd call it, to like from rentals to sales. Thinking at first, just to sell the rental fleet for our investors. And we took a small uh, bit as well for helping them sell it. And then have a product, a 3D image, which we could sell to. And we had to vote, the problem was we didn't have enough money to like make it it's really tough in manufacturing like you have to be very careful with cash cash flows but like yeah but that was our kind of situation like here's where we yeah. are <laughs> like you know so you've got to make the product before you sell it yeah you don't have the money to make the product. i had to make it on a 3d image I mean, and sell the 3d image basically what, like 100 grand or whatever to to build oh to buy that's the cost the cost of what we're selling now we're, we're very our product's very premium product in japan so we're selling about 100 grand in Australia, so it's obviously costs to import it over. Um, it starts around, yeah, it starts a bit less than that in Japan. But when you bring it over, it can start from 90 here delivered. Yeah. But the, yeah, from support so in Japan's perspective, we're on the, we're like, we built vehicles which are way better in, uh, materials, way more spacious than the Japan options. Like uh, the same vehicle would fit two beds in or four beds would be like an eight bed product in Japan, but it's not, it's not really practical. It's just, you know, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we basically had made a 3D image and we sold that to people. Like we had to pick a lot of faith from our customers that we could deliver it. And we did like, I think right away, we kind of, the team was amazing. So, um, yeah, we kind of sold our way out. So of that, that situation. was what 2021 or yeah 2020 2021 yeah, right. yeah so so you pivoted quite quick yeah we had to right away we had no we really had no time we were still trying a bit of like rentals or local market but we were basically busy on saturdays and sundays but not busy monday to friday okay. um so people don't have holidays in japan yeah right so okay you know, yeah okay so new business and then uh how's it been going since then yeah good i mean uh, my vision changed once we moved to more like um a manufacturer when tourism started coming back i was really interested in expanding out like my dream was okay i would love to be like the volkswagen we brought we we, we had in england was like a westphalia which is a german camper van uh man it's a german camper van manufacturer which converts Volkswagens and Mercedes, which are made in Germany, and then it, it, then they export them globally. I, I switched my dream a little bit, or up the dream, to I reckon it would be so good if we could have a Japanese company, which was make, making a really high quality product yeah. and exporting it out of Japan. And that's something I've not seen. I think it's exactly what Japan needs to do, and it's what Japan's good at. 
but it's it's obviously tough. So, and it's exactly what our our teams really got vision around and we wanted to do. Like, let's make great products which are proudly you know made in Japan, and export it from Japan to Australia and and go from there. So yeah, that's kind of a mission that we're on now with that business. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it was very stressful for me. Like a big part of that, like I, I wanted to come to Australia, but I couldn't find a way out because, you know, we've got a factory. There's so many different areas of sales, marketing, manufacturing, making a product, obviously quality and it's, and finance and fundraising and all these things happening. And it's really hard to like, separate myself from that when i'm running the operations but i really feel god in a way in a very way i didn't expect helped me separate myself from that and get me freedom and step up some of the guys on my team um to so that to make it so i was able to actually get out and be here in australia actually building the brand building trust hopefully and, uh, and uh, delivering our first products this t like tomorrow i'm delivering our first product to a customer we sold it to in Australia. Wow. Awesome. We have we have sold to dealers before, but we've, my cool. house is now full of dream drives about like be delivered and stuff. So it's uh, amazing. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely starting to really kick off a little bit. So yeah, wow. bit. that's amazing from dream to kind of reality. Yeah. So, so talking about vocation, like what do you see as? You said, what is your vocation? What would you What would you say? I feel like who are you? What's your contribution to the world? To, yeah, through God, like. Well, I really feel there's a mission in there's like a purpose for us on this earth. Not just like work's obviously a big part of what we do, and we've got talents. And if we if you can be so lucky to do exactly what you want to do in life, like I believe that takes a lot of faith, and maybe like maybe for me a bit of recklessness <laughs> like to jump into it but i really feel like doing like god's put gifts in my life which are in the commercial world but for me like i'm not happy just not being involved with the local church and there's other giftings i've got which i really am passionate about um to kind of like yeah, obviously bring in the income, make it be involved in different kind of workers' lives and making friendships, but also be involved in the church, be involved in helping people come to wholeness, finding Jesus, trusting Jesus. Like to me, it's like if I'm not involved in a great church and involved in seeing people's lives changed, like something's missing in my life, you know, so. Yeah. Someone asked me recently, um, we went around the table and this, this coaching guy asked, like, what is your superpower? Yeah. And I thought it was a, it was a funny question. And then I thought about it and he was like, this is your, your, your best contribution. What is it? So I was thinking about that. Um, I mean, I have thoughts about that, but like, what, what would you say? What, what is your superpower, your contribution, your something from God that, that you bring that is moving the needle what was your answer so i don't think of mine <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i think well i have some some strengths and maybe some similar strengths in some ways um like i would say that your superpower to me is the courage to go from zero to one right and to take the risk right and make something happen even when it seems like wild you're willing to yeah. swing and 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 oftentimes hit i think it's a bit like yeah i think it's thank you i think zero to one like getting something from nothing to a thing and making something a reality is what well, i'd say is my strength but i also feel and that's kind of what I haven't done that many times, but yeah, there's a few businesses like the one before that, which I knew from doing that business is like a HR tech product, but our biggest client was Amazon. 
Um, and we did all, a lot of our marketing for H tech, HR. In some ways, that's amazing. And I, I knew it could have become something much bigger. And it gave me the confidence to be like, okay, whatever we're going to focus on could actually happen. Yeah. So you may as well focus on what you really want to do. If you're going to, if you're going to actually take swings and take faith steps, it's going to happen basically. I mean, I'm not saying that for everything, but yeah. like anything that has happened, someone had an idea and went after it. Yeah. And I think it's great if people have ideas just to go after it and confidently. Um, but I know that God's doing something now for me to maybe be more operationally like I got to a limit and like I went beyond my limit right um I mean it's big, big and it humbled me a lot because I don't think I've been too arrogant necessarily but just what are taking, you saying you got out of your strengths I think I just got I think I just realized yeah I guess I got my strengths or I wasn't honest enough right with people around me I would like I've had to go through a real process of healing and wholeness and maybe I was happy with who I was as a person and feeling like, okay, this is me, this is what I'm like, but not seeing like my limits are or thinking I didn't have limits of stress because I guess things kept working out for me and I'd go through a hard time but then something would happen and it'd work out like something would come up. Like there's times when we need a lot of money soon. And then the phone rings and it's like some amazing thing which happens to come in, which saves us again. That must have happened so many times. And obviously I'm praying for it. I'm, at, I'm down at the river praying uh, for that, but maybe it's not great stewardship or maybe, you know, it's like um, I'm not learning. I'm too comfortable with risk and I'm not digging in and, building better systems and maybe being honest with my team about the situation sure yeah. you could help me fix it and yeah. i'm take it try and just take too much on myself you know yeah going from a mvp to a, a real business yeah that can scale yeah it's a new set of skills that yeah need to be added to that yeah for sure and that's what i'm thinking on and it's great now like i, I love being part of these but you know when i moved to brisbane i came back with a goal of doing the dream drive stuff and you hit me up with oh, i was coming to a church um driving down from a bit of a long way from where my family is up north not that far an hour and a half each way but uh you hit me up with this opportunity to get involved with like building you know outreach um new strategies new ways we could do it uh in australia and that's like a dream for me. Like that's, I've got my my dream in the workplace, but also my dream is to see more people get saved, find Jesus, find wholeness, and get on get on mission with what we're here to do on this in this world, right? So, yeah. So now it, it's 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 you can see, you know, I'm taking on more, but I really believe God's got like something new for me where I'm operating at a better level or being more efficient. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to see what God's gonna do in my life now, in a way. So yeah, I think it's like the next chapter. I think there's more we can do without well, without getting yeah. too, you know, to let it get too uh, overwhelmed, so yeah. Well, I think what I'm seeing is like you're, is like right now you're, you're actually stepping into your vacation yeah i mean you've done a lot of things but it hasn't been like aligned like this before yeah. like where it's really all just heading in the same direction yeah and you can see now what you're doing is basically taking that same gift set applying that to the church yeah how we're we doing outreach how we're you know trying new things um trying to get things from zero to one yeah. A lot of things and seeing what works and then building upon that. Yeah. Taking all of that and it's kind of all heading in the same direction now. So I feel like that's yeah. That's a great picture of what we're trying to say vocation is. Mm. It's not a nine to five. It's a bring you what God has put inside of you to everything that you contribute to the world. Mm. And then the more we can get that 
heading in the same direction yeah over time the more i, fulf- I like fulfill we're going to be yeah and that's obviously a pretty like privileged way of thinking because i understand that you know a lot of places in the world you got to do what you got to do to survive yeah but as we move more and more closer to heaven on mm. earth new creation like god's plan for the world mm. then we are more and more heading towards my gifting my contribution to the world being um what i actually give yeah uh and so that's you know hopefully that you know that's where we're going and yeah as a church we can help people to find that and discover that over time to move more into that so yeah it's exciting i think yeah 100 percent. i think like yeah there's always something we're going after um there's always a challenge in our lives, right? Some big thing. And once you deal with that, the next thing comes up, right? A lot of time. And that's what, I mean, God's really been, God's like really done amazing work in my life in the last, you know, since I've been back, since I've gone through that like um, burnout, I guess, had an episode of burnout, which kind of made us think we got to change something. And God humbled me through that. And I don't think I was necessarily that arrogant, but just like, I don't know if I would have moved at the same time away from that situation had that not happened. And it's also been an amazing season of wholeness with my wife, with my family, going through that, just getting to a whole deeper kind of level and letting God do a work in areas where I felt like I was pretty good, but just kind of realizing some things I thought were good were actually holding me back. Um, And it's continued work he's doing but you know we're so it's so easy to be distracted from what our vocation is or what god's called us to do on this earth yeah. either just by lifestyle or like tr- desires or getting ourselves involved in projects which become bigger and take more of our thinking than possible and some of these things god's in my life were things i've dealt with struggles struggled with for like over a decade been praying about god has dealt with them and I'm just moving on to my next issue without even taking a moment to reflect and say, hang on a minute. <laughs> right. I was praying about that issue for so long, yeah. but it just naturally comes yeah. up. So it's just like, um, I think really getting deep. Yeah, these spiritual practices we're looking at, you know, we're looking at like, okay, having a day of rest, which is not something I would kind of discon- disconnected on the weekend, but I wasn't really thinking about some of these things in the Bible, which are there, we can't read over and think it don't apply. Like there's so much like, if we come in with a bit more humility and think, you know, like talk about our issues, like get advice and try and reach that kind of level of wholeness, I think God can do a much greater work in our work, but also create that space where we can be involved in the real work, which is what God's called us to do in people's lives here on earth. So I think that's really kind of lying a fire and yeah, making me not be so concerned about really the money. Because when you have a large company with lots of staff, you need a lot of money. And it's easy where that can distract you and make you worry about that. But it's kind of out of your hands in the same way, right? When it's that large, it's like, you know, things could happen, another another like pandemic could happen. But God's really dealing with me to be like, trust him, all the scriptures we know all the scriptures but like you got to live it out um and just believe in him like and then have a focus because when you get worried or you stress too much it affects everything like you're disrailed on your day-to-day job your family you can just be like not even you can be doing the work but not seeing the results uh not digging in deep enough or being efficient where yeah for me it's really about like having that capacity to just know when it's happening, go to God in prayer, write out my worries, lay them at God's feet, and then just dig into like what I've got to do that day. Cause like, there's, you know, God, God does use us to like bring blessing. And then it's about not having the arrogance like it was you, <laughs> like being that, keeping that humble heart and that thankfulness to God when he comes through. So yeah, now, now like the worries has been replaced with the confidence, but it's, it's like a daily kind of like path you walk and yeah, I think making that into like a, a way of life is so important. 
so that we focus on the vocation that God's really given us, which is being involved um, in in this church and what he wants to do. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Well, it's, um, I think, pretty exciting days ahead, man. Great to have you here. Uh, it's going to be great to hear some of your story. And, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, so many great guys around right now who are doing incredible stuff. Yeah. That, uh, we're going to get a chance to talk to you over the next, you know, our weeks and months for sure. Uh, getting guys to share in church more just about, you know, how do you bring God to work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a silly way of saying it, but basically how do you, you know, have a, a whole life rather than a segmented life? Yeah. Um, and throw that life at something significant um, with the time that we have. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Yeah, it's really, hopefully our church can be a springboard for that and um, be a blessing to, to many through that. So, yeah, thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. And Good talking. Uh, we'll see you driving around the streets of Brisbane in a uh, dream drive Mate. sometime soon. <laughs>